Right, welcome back to this series uh, of videos looking at kits, uh, either kits I've built um, or where kits I've designed. Um, this time we're looking at a kit I've designed, uh, but it's a bit of an odd video because as you can see there's no there's no model. Um, I was in two minds as to whether to do this video because I don't actually have um, a completed built version of the kit um, to show you. The kit's also never, never gone into production. Um, I'll explain why as we go through the video. Um, but what I do have is some of the parts and iterations uh, that went along the, the line to, to show you how I got to a, a model that was buildable and usable. Um, I've also got some photos of the completed uh, models as well. So what are we looking at? Well, I'll start by showing you the first prototype model I built, which is this thing. So it's, a, it's an odd looking little loco. Um, it's built in 7mm to the foot scale to run on 14mm um, gauge track. So that's what we refer to as 014. So um, it's obviously bigger than the 4mm scale models. Um, not quite twice as big. Um, but obviously still a lot smaller than the 16mm scale uh, things I've been looking at. Um, but this is a, a model of um, a battery electric loco built by Clayton Equipment. It's works number 5843 and was built in 1971. Um, it's a bit of an odd design in that it was um, a one-off. Um, so it's actually based on their um, 1.75 ton um, standard um, loco um, used in mines, tunnelling, um, all sorts of things. Lots of, lots of those were built. This one was built um, with bigger wheels um, to give a higher top speed and that actually makes it a two and a half ton uh, locomotive. There's a, there's a couple of other diff slight differences but nothing that's visual I don't think. Uh, but the bigger wheels uh, were, are the big difference. And this model, this, this locomotive was built specifically to run in one of the old uh, standard gauge railway line tunnels um, through, the, through the Pennines, uh, the Woodhead Tunnel. Um, which is kind of runs um, across from kind of just north of Sheffield uh, to Manchester. Uh, it, it's actually um, at the time um, from where I'm sitting right now filming this, this was probably one of the more um, closest narrow gauge um, lo uh, lines to where I'm, where I'm sitting. So what happened was um, there was an original set of tunnels, uh, Victorian built, um, they were eventually replaced by a, uh, a wider uh, two-lane, two-track two, two um, tunnel. Um, and rather than, uh, at some point, um, they wanted to put big power lines uh, across the Pennines. And the electricity board wasn't allowed to put pylons up um, across the, 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 the peaks. Um, because it would look horrible. So what they did was they put power lines kind of to either side and then they ran the power lines through one of the old uh, abandoned tunnels. Um, so it was just over three miles of tunnel um, and essentially at one side there was a, an oil filled trough that had the cables in and the oil helps keep it cool. Um, and then a two foot gauge um, line along through the entire length of the tunnel um, for servicing purposes. Um, obviously there wasn't much to see outside the tunnel, so it's not a particularly well uh, recorded uh, line photo wise or anything else like that. Um, I'm currently doing a fair amount of research into it uh, for, for one reason or another. Uh, and one of the things I came across was this, obviously this battery, battery loco built by Clayton Equipment. Um, so again, it's a 3D printed um, body. It's actually in two parts. There's a top half and a bottom half. You can see the the join is across the top of here. Um, this one didn't go together very well. I managed to trap some of the wires in the in the edge. Um, as I said, it's a it's a test a test print, um, driven in the same way as the um, the Hudson Hunslet model I designed. So it's got a, a motor at the top, uh, drives a belt drive uh, down onto a pulley that runs along a lay shaft, and that drives the two wheels. The wheels are actually. Um, standard gauge four millimeter wheel sets for um, wagons just pushed in on the an on the axle uh, and then the axles um, shortened um, so that was that was nice they they pretty much bang on for the right size for the prototype um, pickups are done it's a bit difficult to see but there's a little bra phosphor bronze um, strip comes through the side of the model on each side 
uh, and it's folded to kind of give like a springy effect behind the wheels. Um, as I say, this was the this was the first one I built. It does run, uh, but it's very very light and it, it's it's not great. It doesn't have enough weight really um, to sit down on the on the track. But it proved it proved the general the general principle um, that I could I could actually get the, all the motor and everything else to fit. Um, also, um, lots of nice detailing on the etch. You can see here we've got the the kind of um, brake lever I think. Here, this is made up of like nine different etched parts. It's exceptionally fiddly to put together. Um, this is on the back of this. This bit would have batteries in it in the real thing. And there's a, the charging cable and all the wires. Uh, this is the control unit with the handle for, for speed. Um, that's also a separate print, a uh, separate piece just for the way it prints. It prints nicely. Um, but yeah, so um, I say when it was originally built by Clayton, it was in the yellow. Clayton tends to put all their mod well, all their locos in yellow, I think. Um, it's been through numerous colour schemes in between. Um, so at one point it was painted bright orange um, by the electricity board. So at the time that was the Central Electricity Generating Board, CEGB. Uh, they printed it bright orange and put their logo on it. Uh, CEGB at some point became the National Grid. National Grid repainted it in a kind of day glow green um, and put their their newer corporate logos on it and that's the colour it currently still is in. Um, it was sold in 2000 um, by the by the National Grid um, to the Moseley Railway Trust um, so it's now in the fleet at the Apedale Light Railway. Um, it's number 71 in their fleet if you happen to have their, their stock book. Um, yeah so not much else to say about the, the prototype really but as I say um, this is the only kind of complete model I have, but it doesn't really match the final the final design for one reason or another. Um, so um, let's walk through the, the design process. Um, as I say, I've got some photos of completing models and design process bits, and I'll, I'll stick them um, up here. So I'll try and keep the model over here, and then I can add the photos as and when necessary. Um, so as I said, one of the main problems um, was that it's it's very, very light. But as you can see, there isn't a huge amount of space to put any weight. The motor takes up most of this battery box um, on the top. Um, and there isn't really anywhere else to put anything. Um, so the first thing I did, um, well, I should say firstly that the reason I don't have any completed models is that um, models two and three... Um, were built on the understanding that they were going to be sold as part of, uh, as soon as I'd finished them. Essentially, they were they were kind of commissions, um, and I had the understanding of the people who were paying for the builds that I could actually basically kind of um, they would they knew they weren't getting a completed um, kind of production kit model, um, and they were happy for me to kind of experiment as I was doing the build. Um, so each time I've built one, I've tried to make it better for the people I'm building it for. Um, so. The first thing I did with model number two, because um, I, I kind of proved that the the etches were all right and the the general design was okay. Um, I changed the print slightly. Uh, you can see this one kind of bows up because of the way it's printed and the way it fixes to the model. It's it's kind of loose. It falls off um, reasonably easily. Uh, in fact, I can take it if I take it off. You can see how the motor fits on the inside um, there. So I did add a little bit of weight. You can see the liquid gravity in the top. Um, again, um, we've got some of the sparkly dots um, coming onto the print that I mentioned in the last video in this series. Uh, they just rub off. Um, but yeah, so you can see that the motor's kind of held in place by friction against this mount at the front. And then essentially that mount and this mount here um, are a friction fit on the inside of this body. Um, there was also the intention that I would have two screws um, to hold the, the two parts together and you'd kind of insert them from the bottom which was always going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a nightmare. Um, yeah, so um, not, not perfect by any means but as I say it did work. So the first thing I wanted to do though in the next version was I wanted to make it heavier. Um, this thing bounces along the track if you try and run it. Um, but the question was, where was I going to put weight? Well, the obvious place is that this bottom half, other than the lay shaft and the wheels, is pretty empty. It's hollow. Um, so what I did was I decided, well, um, could I kind of fill that space in some way? Now, if you look at this print, 
um, the wheels are completely trapped inside it so essentially um, you put the axle through there's a there's a bearing uh, well a, a kind of bush um, in the pushed into the print and you slide everything through an assembly and it's all all in one place um, which is also a bit of a pain because if you need to change anything you can't get the wheels out without fully dismantling and taking the gears out so what I did on the next one was think well is there a way I could keep the bearings pushed into place without having to glue them in place um, and now often on on um, kind of you know more mass produced models you'll have some kind of keeper plate across the bottom that keep stops all the the wheels falling out and you take a couple of screws out and then you can remove all the wheels so I thought well could I do something similar uh, and use that as a way to get weight in so what I did in the print and I have um, a print here uh, that you can see this is a this is actually a more recent print than even version 2 but it allows you to see the idea um, so what I did was I printed kind of slots here so you can kind of um, the axle will slide through this bit but the bearing won't you can see that the top of the hole is slightly bigger than the actual slot so what you do is you assemble the whole wheel set keep the bearings kind of towards the gear in the middle push the axle into the hole and then pull the bearings out until they kind of engage in the hole at the top and then that stops the whole thing falling out but obviously if you left it like that without gluing the bearings in then the wheels rotating around would eventually um, cause enough vibrations for the one of the bearings to move and the whole wheel would would fall out so what i did was i designed a keeper plate that you would screw you would put in between and it would screw in and hold those bearings in place um, so that looked like this now um, there we go get it to focus so this is 3d printed in stainless steel um, I used stainless steel because it's the heaviest material that shapewears or certainly at the time it's the heaviest material shapewears would print in um, major problem in it is that it's a pain to do anything with so if you want to like smooth the sides for any reason if it's slightly too wide and you need to narrow it filing it is is almost impossible certainly with hand tools it is very very difficult it's exceptionally um exceptionally strong um so this was the first one i did i think and you can see that basically i put two holes in it so that um it would fit in uh, i have another print somewhere that might be a bit better to show you let me just have a look yeah so this one's um this is another oops another test print from one of the phrases um so you would slot it in like that and you would see that then the bearings would be caught against the side um, they wouldn't be able to fall out um, two screws and they would screw into little um, nuts that you'd captured in this top piece here um, and you can see that there's a gap here which allows the, the pulley um, to run in that gap so you don't foul it and then obviously again slots for the focus slots for the axle uh, and the gears in the middle so when you viewed it from beneath all you would see is two screws and two gears which is kind of what you can see on a lot of kind of ready to run uh, locomotives um this was a bit of a bust for numerous reasons one these holes are tiny um, and the way that the printing process works means that they often end up full of um, material now either they end up being just closed completely or they end up full of the the un, kind of unbound material that's not been completely cleaned out either way it's an absolute nightmare to drill out um, by hand or with machine tools um, so that one ended up being um, a bit of a, a bust also um, the holes for where that I was hoping that the, when you put the screw in it would sit flush with the bottom with this little uh, rebate but again those holes didn't open out very well um, in this print so the next kind of evolution of that design was to go with again closed holes you know normal holes but make sure that the top piece was kind of just like a, a horseshoe shape shape really so that the material would fall out um, slightly better but still uh, the holes would would close up um, but again it um, it still you know still fits nicely and again you can see how the screws would would work um, but as I say it's still not not brilliant so we ended up with a third design of this <coughs> which is this which has just kind of got slots for where the screws go um, and it just means that those holes are now big enough that they clean out 
nicely during the printing process uh, and of course once you actually put it in place um, if you put the once you've got the screws kind of in through the holes and tight against the, the nuts on the top um, it doesn't matter that they're actually kind of um, let me get it to focus that they're slots that doesn't that doesn't matter you can just see um, it would hold in in place so that was what we did for number for the for the second version um that model uh was kind of um funded by uh david john uh for his rid layout um his kind of um yeah welsh um slate area uh layout lots of different pieces to it now um there's a website where he describes uh, the layout and all the locos, including photos of of this one. Um, I'll put a link in the in the description. So yeah, so that was that was number two. And as I say, this this thing um, weighs quite nicely. Um, if we have a look, I've got some little little scales. Um, we can see how much it weighs. Oops, no. Wait for it to zero. Oop. Put that on the top. So 70, 80 grams. So it's adding quite a lot of weight um, for for given the, how much space it's taking up. Um, so that was really nice. It was a nice um, addition. Unfortunately, um, it's still not heavy enough. So I found a really nice um, uh, white metal driver figure who fits um, who fits in the on the seat. Um, nicely it's posable um so that you can put his arm on the controller um again i think they're made by um andrew Staten. i'll check that and put a link in the in the description to the particular particular figure um and as i say you can see it on the photos i'll put up of the of the completed second model um but the problem is with all the weight kind of over the driving wheels if you then stick a very heavy white metal figure on this end um when it's driving it has this nasty habit of kind of kangarooing down the track um and it basically it's rotating around this rear wheel um because of the extra weight outside the the wheelbase um not being completely balanced uh by the rest of the model um so it works um david's version i actually managed to fit directional lights as well so tiny tiny little um surface mount leds essentially inside both the front and the back uh, light fitting um, and that worked really nicely so they, they there's no complicated electronics it's just whichever direction it goes the right light lights uh, which is fine um, so so then yeah so we then went having um, somebody else having seen the fact that I built one for well I built this one and then I built one for David that was a lot better asked if I could build another one so I said yes but I still want to improve it because the, the problems with the with the thing so then it was a question of well how do i get more weight in here i still want the weight essentially between the wheels and i want it quite low down because though if it's top heavy it's not gonna it's not gonna help either very much um so what i ended up with essentially was some more metal um so you can see that firstly if we have a look at these two so these are the keeper plates um so I've they're the same way around yes so I extended the front piece upwards so it goes further up into the loco past the front of the pulley uh, I did a similar piece at the back and the whole thing is a bit thicker um, it goes you know it's it's yeah it's a little bit thicker um, so the whole thing is now just heavier um, which is good uh, and still fits um, I think it fits into this version yeah it still fits nicely into the into the into the printed body um, but as I say just goes kind of further up inside um, making sure it still kind of clears the the lay shaft and all the the axles and everything else um, but then I also printed this piece um, which essentially um, is goes the other side of the lay shaft so I, I think it, I'm not sure if it fits into into this one or not um i don't want to take that part it's i printed things like the seat attached to the body and i don't want to take it apart until i actually get around to building it so i don't risk losing it um let's have a look how does this fit so this fits essentially up against 
Can I get it in from the top? Uh, I'd say it's fiddly, once it's in it doesn't really matter, but it, getting it in is obviously um, a bit fiddlier than I remember. There we go. Um, so yeah, so it goes in like that. So now um, the motor still clips into place against these two plastic bits, but there's this metal bit underneath the underneath the motor. Um, still two slots again, so the screws kind of come all the way up from the bottom keeper plate uh, through and into the nuts here. This this metal piece would obviously be glued into into place, and on the bottom it's got a um, uh, a, a kind of groove in it so that it clears the the lay shaft. And the um, uh, and the gears on the on the lace shaft. Um, it also has, if I take it out, um, as well as the slots for the screws. It's got these two slots here as well. And that's so that you can take the wire from the pickups. So the pickups come through these. Get the camera to focus. Um, very hard to spot there. So there's these two little slots here. That's where the pickup strip comes through bends over and touches the back of the wheel um, so you can see from that height there um, essentially you've got one piece of metal sits on top of the pickup strip one piece on the bottom making sure that they don't actually touch the con the pickup strip so you don't get a shot uh, but this lets the wire essentially come from the pickup up to the motor on the on the top and again that adds some more weight so if we have another look at the scales um, we had 80 grams on the last one so we're up to basically almost 150 grams uh, with those two parts. And with those two, um, then the white metal figure um, doesn't cause the locomotive to bounce around. Um, so it drives much nicer on the track. Um, <clears throat> I think, as I say, I've got parts now to build um, another model. I don't have spare etches, but I have the parts. The printed parts um, so I should probably go ahead and, um, and build one for myself I've also you can see the bodies uh, ever so slightly different so I've added this extra kind of step at the front and that me on the compared with the other previous version um, and that means that this piece now is much more of a tight friction fit into uh, the, the top half and also there's this little peg on the bottom of the top half here uh, which slots into here and again gives a bit more grip at the back. There's also a screw hole here so again you can kind of screw this down which is then hidden by the control box which fits fits over the top like that. Um, as I say I think this is pretty much the final the final design now. Um, as I say it's a one-off loco it's difficult to know whether I'd sell any if, if I actually turned it into a, a full-fledged kit. Um, if you want, if you're interested, um, you know the, there's the the parts form. Uh, I'll put a link in the description. No guarantees on this one. Um, it's um, yeah. Um, I really don't know whether I will will will, will do do a full kit or not. Um, this has been a long time in the, in the making, and I think I just want to kind of get one finished for me, and that might that might be it for this. Um, it's also a really odd scale. Um, a 14 uh, seven millimeter scale to the foot. Um, it's not as popular as four millimeter or sixteen millimeter, so there's there's less there's less market scope as it were. Um, but yeah, I really I really like it, and I, I really should build one. As I said, the only thing that I might do differently is I did this um, strip for the pickups, um, which works really well, but it's a bit fiddly to fine tune that it's an, it's springy enough that it makes contact without providing too much friction. Um, I used I. I found out about pl plunger pickups recently when building um, Iva. Um, I think there might be a video um, showing them in use, um, which might actually fit in between the two metal pieces um, without touching and shorting everything out. I need to have a, have a, have a look at the, the 3D model on the plunger pickups and see if they'd fit. Because if they would fit, then that might give me a, um, a better pickup, um, more reliable pickup, and that might be, again, make this thing easier to build. Um, but yeah, so as I say, I've built three of them now. Um, the design is basically finished. The 3D printed parts all work. The weight I really like. Um, I love this idea of actual metal parts for the keeper plate and, and giving the kind of dual, dual purpose of weight and keeper plate. I think it was, um, yeah. I've not seen it on any other kind of um, 
3D printed short run type kits. Um, I think it's a it's a nice idea. Um, yeah, so hopefully um, at some point I'll kind of get enough enthusiasm to come back and, and finish one for myself. As I say, um, I need to kind of get some etches ordered um, before I can do that. Uh, and as I say, I might have a, a look at the plunger pickups. So design wise, I'm calling it finished. Hence, I've done this um, this video. But it may the logo may appear on the on the channel again in the future. I mean, ideally, I'd do one in yellow, one in the orange, and one in the day glow green. Um, so I had a whole kind of full set. Given it's a one-off loco, I might as well do all three, all three liveries for myself. But that's a, that's a much uh, a much longer a much longer process, especially because I'd have to find the day glow green paint that was the right colour. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully you've enjoyed that, and hopefully you've, you've found the the different um, materials and printing processes uh, interesting. So thanks for watching.